Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. On a regular basis, we get a question around the correlation between personality type and ADHD. This is something that we see in questions from our profiler training students. It's something that ends up as a question on our website underneath our podcasts. And recently, we sent out a survey asking people to tell us what podcast subjects they'd like to tackle. And guess what? It was like half a dozen people asked us to tackle the subject. Now, we haven't in the past, and to some extent, because we are hesitant, call this an introverted, um, excuse me, an inferior introverted sensing or memory three-year-old fear, but we have a tendency not to tackle subjects that we don't know a lot about. Like um, neurodivergence is something that neither you and I have studied, you know, in, in complexity. And so we want to be really respectful of topics that have to do with these subjects. And so we just, we just haven't addressed it yet. I would say, to clarify that a little bit, we will tackle topics that we don't know a lot about unless there's been research or people that have made a study of those topics, then we do want to reference the material of experts. Okay, that's accurate. (laughs) Right, because our introverted sensing is like, well, there's like legit study here, so we should be tapping into that study and not just going off on our own, you know, on our own speculation and conclusions. And this is a topic that we knew that there had been study around, but we hadn't really run into anything recent. And so we've, we haven't, I mean, we've hesitated to do a, a podcast on it. But at this point, I don't know if anybody is in the middle of a study. If you know somebody who is doing a modern day, uh, more recent study on the correlations between, you know, personality and psychological types, then please let us know. But in this podcast, we're going to go back and reference some of the older studies that were done and come through that information and see if there's anything interesting that surfaces. I'm at an age where I remember ADD and ADHD was like the topic of the day when I was a kid. And then when I went to middle school and high school age, like my brother, they like casually teachers or people that had to deal with him were like, this kid probably has ADD. I think it was called ADD at the time. And they were going to put him on like Ritalin, a drug to help him calm down and be able to focus to learn. And I remember my parents being very against this idea. They're like, no, he's just got a different learning style. He's hyperactive in general. He needs to express himself and be very physical and active. And we're dead set against drugging him so he can focus in school. Yeah, similar story, but a little earlier in in time or like in, in the time period that it happened, my sister was considered... Um, like, like she, she didn't, they didn't think she had a learning disorder, but they thought that there was something wrong with her ability to, to sit down and learn like other kids. And this was back in the eighties, I think before all of the ADD, ADHD, um, stuff broke out basically. And, or, or, I mean, I don't know if they were even talking about it that early. I don't remember it being in the collective unconscious. When I remember my parents pulling my sister out of school, out of high school, so that she would have a better learning environment. And then later on, she was, you know, my sister graduated in like 1987. And then later on in the 90s, when this became more of a subject that, you know, became a household term, I remember my mom wondering, well, maybe, maybe Tina had ADHD or may, maybe she was ADD. And so I think kind of a similar thing, only we, we were not aware of it at that time. So these personal stories are going to be relevant in this conversation as we unfold some of the study that we're going to reference today. But before we do that, what do we mean by ADD or ADHD? So the definitions we're going to use come from the DSM-5. And ADD is apparently now considered a subtype of ADHD. So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And it's a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by inattention or excessive activity with impulsivity, which are otherwise not appropriate for a person's age. Yes, I am reading this. Some individuals with ADHD also display difficulty regulating emotions or problems with executive function. For a diagnosis, the the symptoms should appear before a person is 12 years old, be present for more than six months, and cause problems in at least two settings, such as school, home, or recreational activities. 
In children, problems paying attention may result in poor school performance. Additionally, there is an association with other mental disorders and substance misuse. Although it causes impairment, particularly in modern society, many people with ADHD can have sustained attention for tasks that they find interesting or rewarding, known as hyperfocus. So ADD is now considered a subtype of ADHD, which is the inattentive kind. And inattentive subtype of ADHD is uh, characterized by being easily distracted, miss details, forget things, frequently switch from one activity to another, have difficulty maintaining focus on one task, becoming bored with a task after only a few minutes unless doing something they find enjoyable, having difficulty focusing attention on organizing or completing tasks, having trouble completing or turning in homework assignments, often losing things needed to complete tasks or activities, things like pencils or toys or assignments, appear to not be listening when spoken to, daydreaming, becoming easily confused and move slowly, having difficulty processing information as quickly and accurately as others, struggle to follow instructions, and have trouble understanding details or overlooking details. Another subtype of ADHD is the hyperactive impulsive type. And this is characterized by things like fidgeting and squirming a lot, talking nonstop, um, dashing around, touching or playing with anything and everything in sight, having trouble sitting still during dinner, school, and while doing homework, being constantly in motion, having difficulty performing quiet tasks or activities, being impatient, blurting out inappropriate comments, showing emotions without restraint and acting without regard for consequences, having difficulty waiting for things they want or waiting their turn in games, and often interrupting conversations or others' activities. And then the third subtype would be a combination of both of these. So ADHD, three different subtypes, and ADD is considered now to be the um, inattentive version of ADHD. On a recent podcast called The Five Subgroups of the Personality Type Community, we had a guest host, Dr. Dario Nardi, on that show. And we were talking with him about how there's been an entire group of people who have done mass amounts of research and studies and have published their work in the past, what, half decade or half century on the Milo system, the Mary and Isabel online library or library online, Milo, M-I-L-O. And we pulled some studies from here around type and ADHD and ADD, and we thought we would go through those to talk a little bit about this on today's show. Right. And Milo is an incredible resource. Uh, it's Mary and Elizabeth. It's Mary McCauley and Elizabeth Briggs Myers. Uh, well, I, I don't know if uh, Isabel was around for when it was created, but it was a, it's a memorial library to her. And um, and both Mary and Isabel were co-founders of CAPT, which is the Center for Applications of Psychological Type. So this would be an appropriate place to gather and aggregate all of these studies and all the research that's happened in the la mostly in the latter part of last century around, you know, I mean, most of these people are psychotherapists, psychoanalysts that were just super into psychological type. And so they used their ability and resources to pour into looking at things like the correlation between personality type and ADHD and those sorts of things. So our strong recommendation is to go check out Milo. Some of the resources are free and available. Others you have to have a library card for, which you have to request access um, for that library card. But we highly recommend going and checking it out because a lot of questions that people have are answered in research papers that are on Milo. So all of that said, the papers we're referencing are, they're a little dated. They're from 1994. And this was, as far as we know, the most recent study, like broad, long, long range study that was conducted around the correlations between these two things. Now, it is a little dated because at the time they weren't making, they were making a distinction between ADHD and ADD, which has since been, um, as mentioned, merged into one classification of ADHD with ADD being a subtype of that, the inattentive version. So as we go through some of these numbers and statistics, just remember, hold space for the fact that there's been a little bit more information around the disorder itself. But I think the information around the study is still fascinating. And what we want to do is pull the patterns and maybe some of the tendencies from these studies to have conversation around it. So even though it's an older study, the patterns 
are interesting and can be useful for our conversation today. Yeah. And we would love a more recent study if you've tapped into one. (laughs) So if you know one, let us know and maybe we'll highlight it in a future podcast. So the primary study that we're referencing is a paper called The Relationship, or excuse me, The Relation Between ADHD and Jungian Psychological Type, Commonality in Jungian Psychological Type Preferences Among Students with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. This paper was um, published by Charles Meskire, Mary J. Poylin, and Kay Herring. Now, I hope I have not butchered all three of those names. I've actually never heard them stated out loud, so I've just read their work before. And this study was done with 614 students and 35 teachers, where 109 of them identified as or what were identified as having ADHD. So 109 students, 15.6%. Another 43 students or 6.1% in the study were identified as possessing ADD. So again, that would be actually uh, 21.7 students were considered to have ADHD with one of them being highlighted as having a subtype of that in modern vernacular. So of these 640 students, then um, 152 of them would have been students that qualified as having ADHD. In the paper, the authors identify and outline their identification process for students with ADHD, their screening procedure, and how they evaluated it, also the supervision of the research committee they used, all this stuff. Yeah, so it wasn't like teachers were like, this kid has ADHD, and they just went, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they, uh, they put some rigor into the study. Yeah, this isn't like Hollywood upstairs medical school <laughs> research. <Right. laughs> like this is, It's an actual like written paper with research behind it. Right. So you ready to hear some stats on how this broke down? Is your, is your introverted thinking excited, Antonia, for... <laughs> <laughs> for numbers and percentage breakdowns. Yeah, it's always it's always horny for numbers. Yeah, right? So again, they d- they made a distinction here between ADHD and ADD. And there's two different lists with these percentages and the ranking. I think I'm going to start at the bottom and work up almost like a top 10 countdown. And we're going to talk about ADHD first and how these break, you know, break up. Uh, there's a tie for 10th place because some of these are tied in their percentages of the students that they got results back from. With a tie with 10th place, uh, 1.16%, there are three types, ENTJ, INTJ, and ENTP. Mm-hmm. Yep, three NT types. And that, I mean, you're, you're an ENTP, so you are, according to this study, you're the least likely to, to have, be ADHD. To have ADHD, yeah. Um, um, we're at the, the, the three NT type, or three NT types are the least likely, according to this study. Yeah, number nine on the ADHD side with 2.33% is INTP. Mm-hmm. So, so then now we have the fourth NT type. Yeah. Uh, tied for number eight is INFJ and ISTJ, both with 3.49%. Tied for seventh place are three types, ISFJ, ESTJ, ESTP, with 4.65%. Now it starts getting interesting in the top six. Here we go. Number six, ISTP, 5.81%. There's a tie for fifth place, ENFJ, INFP, both at 6.98%. Number four, ADHD, ISFP, with 9.3%. Number three, ESFJ, 12.79%. Number two, ESFP, 13.95%. And the number one most likely type, according to this study, to have ADHD is ENFP personality with 17.94, or no, 17.44% reporting. That's right. So you are literally at the top of the list. And I am literally at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that doesn't track for me personally, but I can totally understand. Like when I go over to the the uh, Profile Training YouTube channel and Dr. Dario Nardi's two-hour video about the ENFP brain is on there, comment after comment after comment of ENFPs bitching and complaining about how they can't sit through a two-hour video. And I'm like, what? Are you oh, kidding me? Oh, I know. They're so salty. They're so salty about it. And this this helps explain it a little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I'm like, why Why are you guys so upset? He's giving you two hours of information on research ar- about your mind. Oh, they're so salty about it. So yeah, that it does track. It does track for me, Joel. <laughs> I, I was. I actually am a little surprised ENFPs are the top of the list. I am not surprised that ESFPs are second. But here's what's interesting about this list is that the FP types, so yep. people who use introverted feeling, occupy four of the top five places. Yep. And then ESFJs are the only anomaly there at number three. But then the next one down is ENFJs. So the four FP types, those who use introverted feeling or authenticity, and then the two types that lead with extroverted feeling or harmony, they are all in the top five, the top five. Now, two of them are are tying, but those six types make up the majority of people who have ADHD. Well, and in the definition you read, wasn't there a comment about executive function being Mm -hmm. a challenge for people with ADHD? Mm Mm-hmm. And so executive function, again, we're not directly correlating this, but people that have really good executive function typically are extroverted thinking users, mm. TJs in the Myers-Briggs system. And they're usually the, the ones that can you know, set a goal, set the steps to get that goal accomplished. And the opposite of that is introverted feeling, which what all FP types use. And they have a little more challenge sometimes with that executive functioning. So there is another article that we found on Milo that was published around the same time. And it references the the study that we're talking about right now, but it looks at it through the lens of Kirzian temperaments. So the Kirzian temperaments are SPs, SJs, NFs, and NTs. SPs being what um, Kier, David Kirzi in the books, uh, please understand me and please understand me too. SPs are the artisans. SJs are what he calls the guardians. NFs are idealists and NTs are rationals. And this kind of correlates to really sort of ancient four quadrant typology systems like the sanguine, choleric, you know, et cetera. Those are really ancient typologies. So uh, he's looking at it through the lens of temperaments. And the assumption was that it would be the SPs, particularly the ESP types, that would be the most likely to, um, to, to fit into the category of ADHD and ADD. And I thought that was really, um, I thought that that was interesting that that would be the assumption looking through the lens of temperaments. But when you look at it through the lens of cognitive functions, the much more clear correlation is having introverted feeling or authenticity as your primary judging function. So I think that there's a much stronger correlation there. But... If you do look at it through the lens of temperaments, NTs are at the very bottom. All four NT types occupy the least likely to be ADHD. So through the lens of temperament, the NT portion does seem to track or that that does seem to be a strong correlation as well. Can you give us the name of the study and author? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, It's called ADHD, ADD, Temperament and Learning Styles by Daniel Foster. Fantastic. So you ready to go to the stats on the ADD side? Remember, there's a split back in the day between yeah. these two. Yeah. One was not a subtype of the other. So there are different numbers here. Okay. So so this would be people who have the um, inattentive version or subtype of ADHD in modern vernacular. Yeah. So here's the, here's the breakdown. I'm going to go top to bottom on this one. Number one, reporting at 23.53% ENFPs again. <laughs> They're <laughs> number one of both lists. So I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> Number two, 17.65% is ESFJ. So they bump up a little bit here on the ADD side. Number three, with 14.71% ESFP. Tied for number four, 11.76% INFP and ISFP. Number five, 8.82% ENFJ. Number six, 5.88% reporting INFJ, tied for seventh place, 2.94% ISFJ and INTP. And then this is when things get really weird. (laughs) There's a tie with all the rest for eighth place, ENTJ, INTJ, ESTJ, ISTJ, ISTP, ESTP, ENTP, all thinkers, and they all have 0% reporting for ADD. Mm-hmm. So uh, 
I don't I, I don't know. That feels a little uh, that feels a little suspicious to me. Yeah. But I would say this: there is a clear, clear correlation between both ADHD and its inattentive subtype, which they're calling ADD, between um, feeling and having one of these neurodivergent disorders, right? Like it's the thinker types are the least likely to be the inattentive subtype and the least likely to have ADHD. The only outliers are ISTPs who also happen to be, you know, SP. So that means they're using the cognitive function of extroverted sensing or sensation. But even they're not at the top of the list, really. They kind of fall down the list a bit. And for the inattentive subtype, they're all thinkers. The only thinking type or thinker type that has, according to these statistics, uh, the inattentive version of ADHD are INTPs. And that's less than 3% of the ones who showed up there um, on, on, the, on the study. I mean, and I just want to make sure that we're being clear. It's not that, say, 23.53% of ENFPs have AD. ADHD or um or ADHD or whatever, it's that of the children they studied. That's right. This was the percentage of of those children that were uh, that had had been diagnosed with ADHD. This was the percentage of those children who were of these psychological types or had these type preferences. So uh, obviously, there's some really strong correlations with introverted feeling, being extroverted feeling dominant or that would be a harmony driver and um yeah and being mostly sensor with a couple intuitives in there with enfps being the outliers so i'm looking at this the both these charts because we took these numbers from the report and we laid them out on a chart so i can see them in front of me and i'm noticing that the cognitive function of extroverted intuition is clustered at the top of both lists and it includes uh INTPs near the top in both sides, except for, well, actually, no, NTPs are down on the ADHD side. So that extroverted intuition, when it, when it applies to your type, Antonia, or an INTP, that, that significantly doesn't impact your showing up as ADHD. On the ADD side, on the ADD side, INTPs show up a little higher. And you're still at the bottom, though, which I, I thought was really interesting. I would never have expected ENTPs to be at the bottom of both of these lists. Both lists. I know. It's crazy. I wouldn't have expected that either. I think that that's fascinating. The other thing is that it doesn't seem to be the extroverted intuition or exploration portion that is highly influential. It seems to be the FP portion or introverted feeling. So that I think that there's this misnomer that extroverted intuition is this is almost like the ADHD cognitive function. There's yeah. like this assumption in like the type world, I think I've heard that many times, but that's just simply not true. When it's paired with introverted thinking, it almost doesn't make a blip. But when it's paired with introverted feeling, it shoots to the top. But so does uh, the same thing applies for for SPs. So it doesn't seem to be the extroverted intuition portion. It seems to be the introverted feeling portion. And then you throw oh, in... Did I say extroverted intuition? Okay, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. And then you throw in the extroverted feelers or extroverted feeling function, uh, you know, harmony, extroverted feeling. FJ's using this. And that also seems to uh, have a higher percentage of these kids reporting that function on the ADHD and ADD side. When it's the dominant... That's right. When it's the driver function, because for ISFJs and INFJs, they are way down the list. ISFJs are actually higher than INFJs, interestingly enough. But I, I think what's so fascinating about this is uh, it's not it's not when extroverted feeling is the auxiliary or the co-pilot. But that kind of makes sense because if people who use introverted thinking, which are um, the NTPs and the STPs, they fall pretty far down the list. The only difference is on the ADHD side, ISTPs have a bit of a representation. And then on the ADD, which of course is the subtype, the inattentive subtype, INTPs are on there at all, right? But that's not really, that doesn't really seem to be a strong representation of it. They're not like massive outliers. They're still pretty low on the list. 
when it's paired with introverted thinking, it doesn't seem to be a problem. And in both ISFJs and INFJs, introverted thinking would be their tertiary or 10-year-old function. So they would have a bit better access to it. But when it's the inferior function, when introverted thinking is the inferior, that seems to be the big challenge. And, and this makes sense. Even in the clinical definition, it's the behavior the child shows up with. Now, of course, they're being diagnosed under the age of 12, it seems, in most cases. And this is a challenge that they've experienced for six months or greater, and it shows up in multiple contexts, at home and at school. And one of the things that was brought out in the paper that I talked about before, um, Daniel Foster's paper about ADHD and learning styles, he mentioned that most of the teachers in the study, and, and we noticed this too in the official study that they were looking up, most of the teachers were IJ types. No. Yeah. What? <laughs> and overwhelmingly- I don't believe it. Overwhelmingly ISJ types. No. Both the teachers and the principals. You can't say. I, yeah. And so two IJ types- that have a tendency to create a context, particularly in elementary school, that have a tendency to create a context that is a little more quiet, a little more focused, a little more like sort of memorizing lots of information and effectively going through the education system or presenting teaching, right, and, and materials in a way that's been presented before, um, they are the ones that are tend to d identify these children to begin with. And it's very likely that the context is actually the challenge here for a lot of these types. Now, another thing that was mentioned is that um, there was a there was an individual that was really studying ADHD and then was introduced to the concept of psychological psychological types being potentially influential. And in the paper that Daniel Foster wrote, he said that um, this individual named Judy Provost in an, uh, in an article entitled ADHD, ADD, and Psychological Type mentioned that she feels that she may have in many cases overemphasized type development issues to the exclusion of more ADHD or ADD grounded diagnosis. But she also acknowledges that she may have jumped too quickly to diagnose a whole cluster of children of children's school and home behaviors through the ADHD or ADD lenses and didn't explore more personality-centered hypothesis or pathways, which basically means sometimes it's type needs going unmet and sometimes it's neurodivergence of ADHD. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. I, I don't know, man. Like the people, okay, so this is me going off the rails here. Not being a psychologist, not having like a PhD in this stuff. The entire education system, the system itself systemically is set up to favor students who are able to sit still, focus, and like you said, more of an IJ leaning, more of that rote memorization or rote schooling. The system seems to me, again, Maybe it's different now that I'm older. Maybe I don't. Maybe my memory doesn't serve me well, or it's changed since I was a kid. But it seems like it's set up in a way that favors kids that are are going to be playing to its strengths, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, that's that's got to be a node in the system. I mean, beyond just the teachers, the system itself is what I'm saying. Absolutely, I would completely agree with that. However, I would say because there are still types or people, you know, children and older children that have type preferences that match those contexts and still report having ADHD or through screenings are discovered to have ADHD, Yeah, then that means that it can't just be type preferences, right? It's got, it, there is another component here. So really in, in the conversation, like the question is always, is this just personality type or is ADHD a real thing, right? Or are we overvaluing a diagnosis 
of something that's neurodivergent when really it could just be what you're talking about, that contexts are not created for, you know, for children who have different needs. The, the um, article, again, to reference Daniel Foster's article, he talked about a classification of, of children that could be called actual spontaneous learners. So there are people who want to live freely. There are children who become increasingly bored when activities are um, rote memorization that, that, you know, that there's, a, there's something about the curriculums in school when they become more and more about preparation and following rules and understanding facts that they just can't handle. And a lot of these children actually excel in kindergarten where the action of playing with various objects is the main curriculum. <laughs> really, like, that's what they're supposed to do in kindergarten. And so they're great there. But then when it becomes more about rules and preparation and getting your homework in and all that stuff, that's when it goes off the rails. And I would argue that, that anytime you put a, a person in a context that favors their learning style and suddenly none of these challenges, you know, er, er, emerge then you're not talking about somebody who has potentially a neurodivergent challenge unless you're going to call being an EFP neurodivergent in general, right? Like unless you're just <laughs> deciding that that personality type is neurodivergent. But if we're going to pretend that everybody has like a valid way of entering the world, when you take those people and put them in context that more favor their learning styles and suddenly they're, you know, suddenly they're fine, then we're talking about type preferences, most likely. When you take somebody who would otherwise be in a context that very much suits their learning style and they're still evidencing some of these challenges, then we're talking about something that's a different node in the system. And I think that both of those things have to be, you know, you have to hold, you have to hold space for both those ideas. I'm an ENFP. My brother, my little brother is an ESFP. And this didn't really hold for me. I was able to focus in school and college, everything. I was, I was okay. I wasn't I wasn't unable to focus. My brother, though, struggled a lot, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, to the point where my parents were recommended by doctors and teachers get this kid on some kind of a medication to calm him down. And he just had a very different learning styles in ESFP. He just wasn't going to sit still and learn in the way that the education system was set up to try to have him learn. And so my parents ended up homeschooling him and helping him through that process in order to be able to learn learn well. And your sister, we mentioned her earlier, she's an ESFJ. Was. Was an ESFJ. She's passed away now, but she was an ESFJ. She's also at the top of these lists. And it also kind of tracks in what your anecdotal experience of uh, you know about her was. Well, and I think it's really interesting that ESFJs t jump to the uh, higher up in the list when it comes to ADD, which is the inattentive subtype, as opposed to ADHD where ESFPs are higher. And that makes sense because the hyperactivity piece is the piece of fidgeting. It's the part of the, um, you know, of, of, of needing to express through body and activity. Release, yeah, energy and being activity, which of course would be more ESFP oriented. Whereas my sister, who would have been the subtype of inattentive, she didn't have hyperactivity issues. She wasn't like a ball of energy always trying to, you know, always trying to find an outlet for that. She was just not that interested in school, right? And it was really hard for her to focus and study on things that just didn't capture her, you know, her interest. And that would make sense for extroverted feeling or harmony drivers, extroverted feeling dominance, EFJs. Um, they have introverted thinking as their inferior. Accuracy is a three-year-old process. And so it's, I have noticed that with these types, when they find something that's interesting to them, that introverted thinking or accuracy function really comes through for them by by being able to dive super deep into that one subject. But it's not like they're going to be able to turn that focus on any subject. Whereas the higher introverted thinking is in your stack or, you know, accuracy is in your car model, the more likely you're going to be able to apply the ability to focus to a wider variety of subjects, even things you might be forced to do. I mean, there is something to be said for being easily bored as an NP or as an NTP or even an STP. There is a sense of boredom. But if you need to, you can focus, right? Or at least I've noticed that I've been able to do that. And I've known a lot of, t of my TP counterparts who can focus. Now, if you can't focus when focusing is something that comes along with this function, then it might be something that is evidencing neurodivergence. 
But I think for the most part, it, it tracks and makes sense to me that the, that the TP types would be at the bottom of some of these statistics. But I do find it interesting that when it comes to the hyperactive component of ADHD, the NT types are at the bottom. And there doesn't really seem to be an anxious ball of energy, always looking for an outlet challenge that most NT types have. There's still going to be a percentage that do, right? Again, INTJs, ENTJs, and ENTPs still showed up as at the 1.16%, and INTPs showed up at 2.33% of the ADHD. And so there's still going to be a percentage that you know, are the outliers that are woven into this. But as a general rule, this is not an NT challenge as much. And again, this is a study in 1994 with a group of children. It's not comprehensive, but there are some tendencies and some patterns here that can open up conversation around this. One of the things I want to do is summarize these two lists and put some links to the two article or the two papers that we're referencing under the podcast. So if you'd like a copy of the list that we're looking at right here, or you'd like links to those actual articles on Milo, we're going to link to those below the podcast. Just come over to personalityhacker.com and directly below this show, you can find those resources. Mm. Yeah, let's go through some of the correlations that we see. And, and I think it's good that you make these caveats or disclaimers. There's also challenges in discovering type preferences in children. Now, they used an instrument to determine type uh, or help guide to type preferences that is an instrument that is specifically designed for children. And so uh, it's it, that would be something that would help the accuracy of it. And that said, there's always question marks. Some, you know, when I say always, I mean frequently question marks around children's types. Like sometimes it's just super obvious from the moment they're born and other times it takes, you know, they, they need to be really kind of young adults before you can really see it emerge. So that's it's good to remember that piece of information. But that said, I think that, you know, if we're going to sort of pretend that this is a good resource, which I think it is, yep. uh, I think we should go through some of these dichotomies and the correlations and some of the function correlations that we're seeing. On both lists, there's the top 50% are feelers, literally on both lists, except for ITP, ITPs, INTP on one list and ISTP on the other list. Yeah. So basically, yeah, like you said, with the exception of the ITPs, all the other types are feelers. So clearly that is the number one correlation between ADHD and type is being a feeler. Like that's the, the most obvious one that jumps out. Uh, next, likely, higher likelihood is to be a perceiver. Not a ton, not like it is with feeler thinker. I mean, feeler thinker, it's like so obvious. The next one though is perceivers have a tendency to climb higher in the list than judgers. The big outlier being ESFJs. But other than ESFJs, which are the big, out, like the weird outlier, most of the other ones are perceivers. Um, ENFJs fall in that too. ESFJs, top of the list. ENFJs, middle of the list. The rest of them are basically perceivers. Extroversion comes in here as well. The top three on both lists are extroverts. It's kind of a mixed bag after that. But definitely the top three on you know ADHD, ENFP, ESFP, ESFJ, and then on ADD, ENFP, ESFJ, ESFP. So it's the same three types, just a little different order. Yeah. But after that, like you said, it's mixed bag, right? It just kind of depends. Uh, they're more likely to be sensors. With the exception of the number one outlier of ENFPs, the rest of them are majority sensors. Um, and then INFPs come in there too. So again, it seems that introverted feeling is the one thing that's super high on the list no matter what. But for the most part, sensors are more likely to be um, diagnosed as ADHD than intuitives, according to this. But the number one standout is thinker-feeler. Thinkers are far less likely. And, uh, and the numbers get real small. The percentages get real small when you talk about thinker-feeler. As far as functions go, clearly, as we've mentioned, introverted feeling or, or authenticity is at the top of the list. And the next one is extroverted feeling when it comes to um, it as a dominant function. But then after that, it does seem that there's a strong corollary with extroverted sensing. And that would make sense, particularly on the ADHD side. Extroverted sensing shows up very highly on that side. And then after that, it feels like um, there's no real rhyme or reason. After that, it doesn't really feel like any other cognitive function really steps out uh, and or any other temperament. Like you look at it through lots of different lenses, temperament, dichotomies, cognitive functions, and the rest of it does feel very much like a mixed bag, except NTs 
occupy the bottom of ADHD. And thinkers don't even make the list for for the most part on ADD. So I feel like I need to be an ambassador for <laughs> everyone that's diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, even if I ha- even though I haven't been diagnosed this, my personality <laughs> type is at the top of the list. So I need to speak for all of you, all of us that might be pigeonholed here, whether it's valid or not. Um, by the way, I just want to make a comment that I hope it does not come across that there's anything necessarily wrong with being ADD or ADHD. I don't see it as a as a challenge. Like if someone's diagnosed with that, I don't make any judgment to that. It's just a diagnosis that you get from a professional. I think that needs to be that needs to be taken into account that it's totally like not an not an issue in my mind. Well, it might be a challenge for the person who's been diagnosed. Sure. So we should probably be clear that it might be a challenge in your life, uh, but it, there's no stigma yeah, attached to exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what I mean is I don't I don't see any judgment toward a person that has this diagnosis. Right. And I don't think there should be. Having said that, I have a dream that we could we could start to use some of these understandings to look at the institutions and the ways we go about education, uh, you know, child rearing, the growing up process of kids, the activities they're allowed to do or not allowed to do, all of these things that we look at, you know, as as I grew up, I saw like simple things like playgrounds and play spaces get more and more safe and contained more school-like, right? It wasn't free-form play. It was much more structured and school-like. And and everything seems to be more safety-focused and more calm, quiet-focused, steadiness. Like that feels like that's what's being served up to kids these days. And I think it's really great that, and, and, and it also is through like devices, you know, like we'll sit here and you learn through this device or you even just watch something to entertain or babysit yourself while mom and dad are busy. And we've been you know, guilty of that with our kids from time to time. Hopefully, though, we can start as humans, especially now in our day and age, look at some of these tendencies and these trends and these patterns and find other creative ways to support children that are learning and growing and developing. Because the old ways of learning and growing, like you don't graduate college anymore and have a preparation for the world. The world changes every six months or even more frequent. There's so much information, so much changing. So we as humans have to learn how to learn and we have to be able to learn quickly and adapt and be very multidisciplined on the things we know and study and and understand. It can't just be all about, you know, science and math. It's no longer the Cold War trying to build missiles to, you know, beat the Russians or beat the Americans if you're in Russia. Like we need to look at this in a much different way. We've got a very creative we have very creative challenges coming down the road. And so we have to help our kids approach them in a creative way. So I understand, and you were talking about teachers earlier, Antonia, you know, a lot of IJs, and I made a little fun, like, oh, no, and I was kind of kidding about that. But teachers have a challenge of educating a large group of kids, keeping them moving through curriculum and understanding things on a timeline. And that is actually a big job. That's a tough job to do. And they get it done. A lot of my family members are teachers. My aunt's an ISTJ, and even in her classroom, she has this, like, she used to have this device in there that would... Catch, catch the decibel level of the room and send an alarm off. And the kids had to keep it under a certain decibel level in order to like have certain privileges that day in class. What I'm trying to say is there are teachers who have a big job ahead of them and they're doing a really good job in educating students in the way the system is set up. And my dream is that we could look at the system itself and say, are there other ways we can augment and educate, you know, augment the educational process for kids that are more creative and would accommodate kids that are actually diagnosed with these challenges like ADHD and ADD, or they're just personality types that don't learn that way. Hmm. Yeah, you're much nicer and diplomatic about this subject than I am. Uh, I think- Well, on the air I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, and I genuinely do appreciate teachers. I really oh, do. Oh, I do too. I, I very much appreciate them. I think the system isn't set up to help them either. No, and in fact, I think as parents, and maybe I'm gonna give myself permission to talk crap about parents we do so much outsourcing of parenting to teachers and institutions we expect we expect them to raise our kids for us and they're doing it in a system that like you mentioned it's like post-war industrial setup where You know, they were trying to do two things. One, they were trying to train people as factory workers by having bells that they obeyed. And on the other side, they were trying to raise a batch of scientists 
in order to, like you said, win the Cold War. And we haven't really done a lot of reevaluation since then. I mean, there was a time period where they were really trying, I think, by rolling out things like Common Core. But honestly, now that I'm now, now that I'm homeschooling and then cyber schooled, you know, cyber schooling my daughter and I'm looking at this Common Core curriculum, it really feels like an intuitive idea that was rushed and and put together by bubblegum and popsicle sticks. Like it's it's really it could have been so much better done. And so we're looking at like attempts to do this, but obviously there's there are bigger components in the system that they're wrestling against. And so it's just kind of all of a big mess. And I think in this time period in history, we're living through a pan- a global pandemic which has had a lot of kids um, now start homeschooling, cyber schooling. There's a lot of question marks around what's going to happen to our formal school system and how that looks. And quite honestly, uh, it is getting more and more uh, focused on things like safety. And you mentioned this idea of things being safe. And I think that we are not doing our children any favors by forcing them into our sandbox when safety is our comfort zone. There's a bunch of kids who may be diagnosed with neurodivergent or or educational challenges that we are saying that they're the problem when in reality there's the the top kids according to this that have, were diagnosed with ADHD are not safety oriented personality types they have to have risk they have to be able to take chances they have to be able to make messes they have to be able to be loud and big energy and learning in the moment and be about performance not about preparation like they need to they need to be able to spread their wings and we get really really scared because we're in a time period of history where we don't really have to deal with say infant mortality as much and we don't have to deal with the toughness of you know in the past nature was metal <laughs> like not all of us made it And because we're not used to having to deal with those challenges and the heartache that comes with it, we've gotten pretty soft. We're real soft as people. We're emotionally and psychologically soft. And then add on technology and devices and babysitting kids with devices and getting them addicted to things with backlights and not wanting to go to the park because it might not be safe and who's going to be there and not letting our kids walk to the park by themselves because, oh, no, they could get kidnapped. And like, I mean, we're just we are so helicopter. Of course, these kids are freaking out. And that is completely and utterly predictive. <laughs> That's very predictable. <laughs> so I fought the bottom of both of these lists. I'm not a person who's really ever been challenged with any of this. And yet I really see, I, I see a, a, um, a, a bigger challenge, though, of observing how we are forcing, how, how we have had a habit for decades now of forcing square pegs into round holes. And instead of accommodating those square pegs, we just keep beating them with hammers and getting more and more and more in our ruts of safety and comfort and safety and comfort and safety and comfort. We're doubling down on these things. And I guess we're physically safe, maybe, but are we emotionally able to, I mean, like, like uh, we have so many mental health issues these days. I'm not going to put it all down to type, of course. Obviously, that would be ludicrous. But we have so many mental health issues that, in my opinion, show that we're favoring our physical safety over our emotional and mental safety. And if our emotional and mental safety is going to lead us down self-destructive paths, well, then we're not really getting our physical safety in there either. So I guess this turned into a little bit of a, of a, a pulpit. <laughs> Preach it, sister. But I think when I look at stats like this and I see that there is such a um, such a, a, a one-sidedness to this. Like there's so much weighed on these certain personality types. Like FPs, what do we know about FPs? What do we know about introverted feeling? It needs to express. 
What do we know about EFPs that they have to express? What do we know about SPs that they have to be in their bodies and they have to be performative? What do we know about these types? What do we know about FE dominance that they understand things through communication and socially and by being able to talk it out, not by sitting there quietly at a desk with a piece of paper and a, a, and a pencil or actually in modern day, I'm sure, with a device. So there are a lot of things that I think that these kinds of studies and looking at it through these lenses can, can give us some hints as to implications and maybe some hints as to some of the things that we can do as individuals, as parents. Maybe we don't have control over school systems. We don't have control over classrooms. We don't have control over how anything else is, anybody else is doing anything. But we have control over our homes and we have control over the context that we create for our children. And maybe we can see how things like this really reflect back to us in need to get our type preference needs met and create a little bit more opening, a little bit more space for people who don't think like us, who are not obsessed with safety, who is not obsessed, like those are not our type needs. We have different type needs and, and woven in that is where we get our self-esteem, our self-confidence, our self-worth, and the ability to take care of ourselves and prepare ourselves for adulthood. So yeah, these kinds of studies aren't just numbers. I mean, I know that this podcast started out with a lot of data and numbers and percentages, but the the numbers on the page to me create a really interesting picture when applied to different elements of real life. So what do you think? You've been listening along with us. You're the third person in this conversation. You haven't had a microphone, but now is your turn to come and make your voice heard over at personalityhacker.com directly below this podcast. Leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. Maybe you have had ADD or ADHD diagnosed in your own life as a child or uh, throughout your life. Maybe you have a child in your life that's been diagnosed this way. Maybe you were sort of diagnosed this way, or maybe people in your life thought this, but you just <laughs> think you're maybe just an EFP. Who knows? <laughs> share your story. Tell us about your experience. We'd love to hear what's going on for you. And uh, if you have any references to other studies, I'm sure if you put those in the comments, other people that are listening to this could also reference those as well to uh, to go get more information so we could keep the conversation going around this. Mm. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We also have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave a rating and review on Amazon or Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And of course, we subsidize the, the podcast with our own pro programs that we produce that are personal development through the lens of personality type. So if that is interesting to you and you'd like to invest in yourself and in us, you can head over to personalityhacker.com, look under our program catalog and see if there's one that's right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning. We are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.